Hello and welcome to the Beans webinar. This is a bilingual webinar, so uh, we invite you to choose your um, language of interpretation, English or French, by clicking on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you should then be able to choose your language. And we also invite you to click on mute original audio. Vous pouvez choisir le canal audio pour écouter. Now this is the English, uh, this is the French, sorry, uh, version of what you've just heard. So if you're hearing my voice, I'm the interpreter, that means you have found the interpretation and so the test is a success and you'll be able to follow the entire presentation in English. Enlever l'audio original. Um, pour ceux qui viennent par téléphone, if you're here on your phone, une traduction, donc vous, vous entendrez les, les présentations dans le, la langue d'origine. If you're joining by phone, you're not able to choose any you, language interpretation, so you will hear the original voices of. You them. won't be able to hear language interpretation. Rebecca, it's all yours. Thank you, Hugo. Really, thank you. Uh, Hugo is the regional. Uh, coordinator for the Bauda Initiative on Canadian Seed Security in Quebec. And he's our wonderful tech host today behind the scenes. And hello, my name is Rebecca Ivanov. And it's just a pleasure to see you all here today. I'm the seed program manager at the Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario. And as part of my role here, I implement the programming of the Bauda Initiative. I'm also a seed keeper who has a great affinity for beans. I love their stories and delicious dishes that they become. Um, I don't know about at your family meals, but at my family gatherings, you will nearly always hear someone loudly ask, who made the beans? And then someone describes how they made the delicious Bulgarian dish bop to anyone who will listen. Now, beans, uh, come from the wild vines of Central America. And there are thousands growing around the world today from Macedonia to Malaysia. This incredible diversity of beans encompasses many unique varieties that seem anything but common, even though we call it a common bean. This diversity didn't happen by accident. Farmers selected the plants that they liked the best and saved the seeds from them, nudging beans towards perhaps larger seeds, heat tolerance, disease resistance, and more. They pass these seeds and knowledge down to the children and the cycle continues. So every bean that you see today is the work of thousands of people. And I'd like to acknowledge the human and crop ancestors in South and Central America who first came together in this co-evolutionary process that gave rise to the beans that we continue to enjoy and work with today. And while we're meeting virtually today, I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. The lands we live on, work with, and plant our seeds into. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all Indigenous people that call this land home. I'm joining you from the homelands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Chinatan, and I'm about, away, about an hour away from Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve which is demographically the largest First Nations reserve in Canada. And all of these nations have a long history with beans long before my ancestors were cooking them. We encourage you to learn more about the history of the land you have a relationship with by visiting whose.land and nativeland.ca. Hugo will put those links into the chat so that you can have a look at them. And in fact, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're joining from us from today. One of the strengths of our seed community is how incredible it is that folks are so open to sharing their knowledge and experiences. With that in mind, I want to mention that the goal of this space is to create a safer space. I hope that everyone will feel comfortable sharing, asking questions, learning together. If you're someone who tends to not speak a lot, I invite you to move up into the role of speaking and ask a question. If you tend to speak a lot, I invite you to move into the role of listening. And when you do speak, speak from your own experience. And if there's any concerns or ideas of how we can do this better, I invite you to reach out to Hugo or myself. 
Now, there's some ways that we can engage and connect during the event today. First, as I mentioned earlier, please introduce yourself in the chat. It's so wonderful to see folks doing that already. I will ask you to stay, mute, stay muted when you're not speaking. And as you've noticed, we are recording this event. So with that in mind, you can choose to have your video on or off. If you'd like to ask a question during the discussion part of the session, there are two ways you can do this. First, you can use the chat by clicking uh, on the chat button in your Zoom bar and Hugo or I will read the questions aloud to the speakers. And second, you can raise your hand and then ask your question via audio or, vi or video. To do this, you can click on the reaction button and then find the raise your hand button. This will indicate to me that you have a question and when your question is up, we'll ask you to unmute and you can uh, do that directly to the presenters. If you're having technical difficulties, I have to say some one of the best tips I've heard is just to turn your video off. It sometimes really helps. If you're still having trouble, feel free to send a message privately to Hugo and he'll see if he can help. And yes, I am so excited to welcome you again to beans breeding and selecting specialty varieties. For those with questions about growing and saving bean seeds, we will be sharing some um, presentations, particularly one that was done by a seed saver in Atlantic Canada as part of the Bowder Initiative. You can find it easily on the Seed Change YouTube channel. We'll share the link later. Um, I was asked to mention this because this webinar will be focusing on bean varieties and selecting and breeding. And wow, we have 62 folks joining us today. So welcome to all of you. According to the registration forms, which we're still filling up at like 3.30, we have participants from all across Canada with high representation in Ontario and Quebec, but we also have many folks from outside of Canada join, joining us today. About two thirds of you said that you grow your own seed for your own use and for sharing with the community, and about an eighth of you said that you uh, grow seed as a commercial seed business. But enough uh, from me. I am now so pleased to introduce you to our three speakers. So first up, we will hear from Bob Wildbaum. Bob is the Executive Director of Seeds of Diversity, a national seed saving group that collects and preserves seeds of Canada's food crops to ensure a genetically diverse seed supply in the future. Then we'll have a presentation by Lisa Blednick of Blednick Family Farms, a well-known seed keeper. Bloodnick Family Farms is a diverse horse-powered family farm serving their community around Appalachian, New York since 1992, I believe. In addition to growing vegetables, herbs, and flowers, they raise a small flock of heritage breed sheep and make maple syrup. Lisa is also very involved with seed keeping, and I recall her once describing herself as a one-woman walking seed bank with over a thousand varieties of beans alone. Our final presentation will we will be with Henry Cordoba Novoa. Henry holds a BSc in Agronomic Engineering from the National University of Columbia and currently is a PhD student at the Pulse Breeding and Genetics Laboratory at McGill University in Montreal. He has experience in plant breeding and genetics, the evaluation of plant cultivars, and has also participated in research projects aimed to determine the microbial diversity of agricultural soils. So cool. His current research is focused on studying the genetics of complex traits and the accumulation of mutations in self-pollinated species, using as a model our current favorite plant, the common bean. So how this will work is we'll have all speakers give their presentations back to back, and then we'll have a discussion period. If you uh, come up with questions throughout the presentation and don't want to forget them, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll ask your questions to the presenters during the question and answer and discussion time at the end. And now without further ado, I will pass it off to Bob. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, Bob Wildfine. I'm with an organization called Seeds of Diversity, which is a seed saving organization. And I've uh, put together a very brief overview of the uh, beans that are available from Canadian seed catalogs. So. Uh, this probably should be clarified a little bit that it's bean diversity in Canada, and it's also bean diversity of horticultural varieties that you would find in garden seed catalogs. It doesn't necessarily include all um, agricultural beans because that's a different data set. But the, um, 
the bottom line is we have uh, about 100 uh, garden seed catalogs or seed companies in Canada. And among them, we have found 566 different named varieties of beans this year. So that sounds like a lot, but um, when we get into it, you'll find that there are uh, a lot more that are not uh, available in this list. And so I've kind of organized this in three categories. On the left are um, some bean varieties that you can get in large quantities. If you're looking for beans by the pound or beans by the 50 pound, um, there are not that many, only about 35 of uh, those 566 uh, cultivars are available in bulk sizes. And so these are the ones that you probably know if you're a, a, a seed grower, if you're um, a market gardener, uh, they're the pretty common, ordinary, most popular varieties. And I've chosen provider as an example of that. Provider being um, is uh, it's very reliable. It's, it's uh, quite well known. It's available from lots of seed companies, 25 of them, which is a quarter of all the seed companies in Canada um, have provider seeds and you can get them in big quantities. You can get them in conventional or organic. Uh, it's a real workhorse kind of variety. Um, one of the things that I, I often find when I talk to new seed growers, people who are getting kind of excited about being able to grow seeds at a good quality and wanting to maybe grow some to sell. One of the mistakes that they sometimes make is to try to produce seeds of the most popular varieties. It sounds good at first glance. Lots of people buy provider beans. So if you produce provider beans, you should be able to sell them. And sometimes that works. Very often people run into a situation where the market is flooded with that variety already. There are lots of people producing that one or they're produced in a large scale. Uh, by perhaps a mechanized producer who can make those seeds at a much, much less cost than uh, a small scale producer can do. So um, what I often advise is instead of jumping in and uh, producing seeds of the most common variety that you figure somebody will probably buy, what you should always do is talk to someone who runs a seed company. They will know what they, for example, would like to purchase from you. They'll know what's actually in demand and they'll, they'll know what's worth selling from their point of view that they maybe can't buy quite as easily. And that's where they'd be looking for a grower. It's often not the very, very common ones. It's more often in the second category, which is the other 94% of all of our uh, bean varieties that are available for sale in Canada this year. Uh, 531 out of 566 cultivars are only available in packet sizes. They're not available in pound bags or 20 pound bags, just packets. Uh, it's often more uh, economical for a small scale uh, seed vendor to sell by the packet rather than to sell in a large quantity. If you look at the prices of a, say a two pound bag of bean seeds versus a packet and do a little bit of math, you can find out that by the packet, they make more money selling those packets. Now it's more work to sell because you're selling one packet, then another packet, then another packet, instead of selling a whole bunch of beans all at once. Um, so there is a, an, an economy of, of scale in terms of how much profit you would make per bean, but there's also a cost in terms of how much marketing you would do. It turns out that for most of our varieties, 94% of them, it has not become economical for Canadian seed companies to sell those varieties in bulk. However, um, if you were someone who were interested in producing for uh, a small scale seed company, it would probably be one of those that they'd be interested in, like I said before. And then in case you think that 566 cultivars should be enough beans for anybody, um, that's actually just a little bit less than 10% of all the beans that we could be selling. When we look at other places where there are beans like the US market, or we look at um, seed banks in particular, we find out that there are at least 6,000 different kinds of beans out there. So when we have 566 cultivars for sale in Canada, we're really only marketing less than a tenth of all the varieties that exist. Um, and I, I wanted to put a picture here and I realized I had to choose one out of 6,000. So there's no particular reason why I chose this one. Rolanda's a really nice uh, uh, filet bean, really nice. Uh, I'm growing it this year and I've been enjoying it very much. Um, you, can't, you can't buy it from any seed company in Canada, as far as I know. It was sold um, in Canada in 2012, was the last time it was grown. 
or, or last time it was sold in Canada 10 years ago. A couple of companies in the US that sell the seeds. Um, that's, well, I got mine from my own home saved seed. That's the other place where these things exist. And uh, if you could advance the slide, I have one more. So to complete an overview of bean diversity in Canada of horticultural varieties, this is the kind of slide that you should never have in a presentation. There's a whole bunch of numbers here and no pictures. So this is for the, the three seed diversity nerds in the audience who are really, really keen on this, okay? Um, find the number kind of at the top of the column, 566. That's the number of uh, bean varieties that are for sale in Canadian seed catalogs in 2021, okay, this year. And down that column, those are the number of bean cultivars that were available in Canadian seed catalogs year by year going back to 2008. So you see two things. Um, you kind of see that we have a lot more now than we did back in 2008. Uh, 13 years ago, we only had 381 cultivars on the market in Canada. Now it's 566. That's a really huge increase. But what I'd like to point out to you um, is that it's not the same cultivars every year. If, if you think 13 years ago, we had 381 varieties, and then the next two years later, in 2010, there were more. But what actually happened is we lost a whole bunch of them. They fell out of, uh, uh, out of uh, commerce in Canada and more came into sale, but more came in than went out. And then the next two years, the same thing happened. Some were lost out and some came in, but more came in that, that then went out. So that's why the numbers kind of increase. What's actually happening is there's a lot of turbulence, a lot of change. We, we lose as many varieties out of our seed catalogs every year as we gain in. And if I look at all of the different varieties that exist in the whole 13 years, there are 1,034, that number at the bottom. That's the number of distinct cultivars that I find in all the seed catalogs all put together during that period of time. So right now, we only have about half of all the varieties that have been for sale during that period. And the other half were for sale, like the Rolanda bean that was sold in 2012, but is no longer in Canada. So those of you who are still listening, the three of you who uh, are fascinated by this, you're probably wondering, where can I get more information? And the uh, address down on the bottom left, that's um, free data, the open data. It means that uh, all the information we've collected over that 13 years is available to you. And you don't have to write it down because I'm going to put that in the chat right now so that when we move the slide on, you'll still be able to see that. And the one thing I ask is uh, don't everybody click on it at once. It's a huge file that will download and it takes about 20 seconds for it to do that. And if everybody clicks on it at the same time, nobody will get it because it'll crash. But after the presentation, have fun. And thanks very much. Thanks so much, Bob. That is wonderful. I think there's been a few uh, comments in the chat that uh, if you're in good company with fellow um, seed nerds. I'm now going to put up Lisa's slides. Welcome, Lisa. We're ready thank when you, so you are. For, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in your workshop here. A um, little few, um, I see one of my neighbors actually just joined in the chat room. Um, so I, we are market gardeners. You can actually go to the first slide. Becca has control of my screen, so. Can you advance one? There we go. Um, we're market gardeners. We've been farming, um, doing market gardening since 1992. And, um, you know, we grow regular green beans commercially for market, um, you know, well, green and wax beans. But about five or six years ago, we got involved, or I got involved in, um, actually it's been more than that, six or seven years ago, I got involved in growing, um, doing grow outs for individuals and um, small seed companies, um, which I'll discuss, and um, growing out rare beans. I had some experience um, growing gala link sensitive beans from South America, a bunch of different things. And um, 
And although Rebecca, when she introduced me, she said, I'm one woman walking seed bank with a thousand brides, which I did have at one point. I've been working pretty hard the past number of years, actually dispersing them and giving a lot of them away and focusing on um, one particular collection that I'm going to talk about a bit. But um, if you want to flip forward another slide. Uh, my husband and I, and that's my son on the walk behind the plow, um, work. We have a five acre diverse farm, work with a draft horse, Annie. And uh, yeah, so just a little picture of who we are, what we're about. But I really love beans. Beans um, to me are, they're so much fun to grow, and especially for seed saving. They're very tactile, they look beautiful on display. Um, when I was younger, I used to do a lot of bead work, and now my eyes suck through. <laughs> As I get older, they're terrible. And, um, you know, but beans kind of give me that same feeling. When I, you know, I also do other crops, a lot of seed saving with other crops, like say tomatoes and things like that. And all tomato seeds kind of look basically alike. You can't tell the difference or have any hint of what they're going to mature into by looking at the seed. But beans are super visual. They're super tactile. I love like running my hands through like a whole bin full of beans and um, they just feel nice and they look beautiful. And uh, you know, they're easy to display. Um, I like going to conferences and um, bringing a lot with me. We do a lot of hands-on, like I encourage people to touch and interact. Um, and over the years, you know, the one thing I want to emphasize is the community and network that we've, you know, build as seed savers and sharers and the importance of sharing with others. Um, you know, and I was um, absolutely, you know, a beneficiary of many, many people's generosity over the years in formulating my seed collection. Um, the one in particular that I'm well known for, and plus they're just dramatic, reaching for the sky like this picture. Um, one variety that I have become associated with, is I call Sakura Blue. Um, and this is a great story of you know the importance of sharing and the you know the observation skills you gain gardening. Um, this was kind of a fluke thing. Um, first of all, the color is stupendous. Blues, the true blues are hard to find in nature. Everyone asks, um, you know, does it stay blue when you cook it? No, it just cooks down to like a you know regular brown kind of looking bean, but it has a kidney bean kind of texture to it. So the, um, you know, it maintains its shape. It's pretty sturdy bean. Um, any place a kidney bean is appropriate, these would work really well. Um, but the story behind it is it, it basically circumnavigates the globe. Um, there was a seed saver in Germany, Wilfred Funk, who found a sport in his garden. And I don't even know what the original patch was supposed to be, but he had a very short blue bean and he just called it dwarf blue. Um, he shared it with a man, Jean-Luc Guitard in Italy, who shared it with a friend, Rick Rickman here in the United States, who shared it with me. And it was a dwarf. I planted a row and there was um, you know, a very short plant, maybe about, mm, 18, 20 inches tall, and um, it had pretty blue beans. And um, so, but it had a couple, you know, semi-vining ones. And so over the last six, seven years now, I've been selecting the longer, you know, more towards, I wanted a pole bean, because as I said, I'm getting old and my knees are <laughs> creaking. Um, so I wanted a pole bean to pick. And so I kept selecting and, um, you know, I'm not a bean breeder, I'm an amateur. So this was not a result of anything other than just um, every time you save a seed, you're placing selection pressure on. And so I kept saving the, the ones, you know, going from a dwarf to a semi-vining to now it's a pretty consistent seven foot pole bean and um, it's spectacular blue. Unfortunately, the blue also darkens pretty quickly. So like when you have a jar of them like out on the counter, they do darken, you know, fairly fast, but these are the fresh color and it, they're dry and mature in this picture, but, um, and I am selling them through the Experimental Farm Network project. So anyway, it's one of my, my favorites and love it. Um, the color is magnificent. Um, you know, and that's what I wanna point out with like any, anything is just observation in the garden. And, you know, if you see something you like, you know, try and save the seeds and, you know, adapt it to your local area and 
um, it can be done pretty quickly. That blue bean still has a bit of black and um, some kind of a grayish blue in it. So each generation I select against that, select for the brightest colors and the nicest finds. And it's super disease resistant too. Um, you know, biodiversity, um, you know, works the same way. Um, I'm sorry, I was just reading that chat. Um, the soccer blue bean, if somebody's asking if there's a link to buy, I will put the experimental farm network project link up. Um, and I have to harvest yet yeah, still, they're still in the field and they do ship. So to Canada. Um, anyway, biodiversity, the thing about beans and any, everything, everything we eat is that, um, you know, we've selected, you know, each, each group of people you can select for nutrition, for color, for disease resistance, um, all sorts of, you know, different, you know, kind of, you know, place importance on different qualities. Um, and the thing is now we're in a race, you know, where we're losing biodiversity at a great pace, um, you know, with conglomeration seed companies and, you know, favorite things like, you know, um, Bob was talking about, you know, that the actual trend was going up in seed companies um, slightly, but overall, like you can, especially not popular trending vegetables like cabbage, there's so many fewer cabbages than the word like, you know, 1890 or something. Um, so, you know, once the, the, you know, concentration of seed varieties um, is in the hands of so few people in the industry, you know, it, it becomes, you know, threatened if they're not good sellers. And there's other reasons to grow something besides being the best seller. Um, and um, let's see, one of the things with biodiversity is the, um, I do some work with beans for, um, you know, getting beans from the USDA uh, runs several seed banks, the GRIN system, and you can request samples. And that's where you can get some re really rare, unusual things. I'm sure Canada has seed banks too. If you have, you're using them for educational purposes, you just have to submit a request and, um, you know, they, can, they if you are, have um, like a, a educational purpose for them. And that's how I've actually obtained some of my re really unusual ones. Um, and somebody just asked about my bean display things. They're just spice bottles that you can get like at any, you know, home goods store. And uh, yeah, because I go to a lot of, of talks. So, um, but it does make little nice display bottles. Um, and, just uh, talking about Grin has been a tremendous, you know, people over um, many years now have, um, you know, contributed samples and they're put into good storage conditions. Whereas um, a lot of, you know, and you can access these, but um, the experimental farm network requests a lot of different um, seeds and I have done grow outs for them of a lot of different things over the years. Um, and their specialty is growing seeds that are threatened by climate change and social change. And um, so, and especially like, for instance, I did a, I know this isn't beans per se, but I did a sorghum for the um, experimental farm network that was from Grin. And um, it was from a um, village in Sudan that was, um, the village was destroyed in civil war. And the plan is to give it to growers like myself. We grow it out, we increase stock, and we, you know, once the village is resettled, um, that we'll send it back to them so that they can have their traditional food back again. Um, so we try and work a lot also with um, climate change threatened things. And, um, the, you know, um, I did a watermelon from, I think it was the, I want to say the Maldives, some sea, sea some place that was threatened by um, um, rising sea levels um, due to climate change. So there are groups out there and they are actively looking for growers. So it's a good opportunity for any of you that are experienced growers to um, contact Nate Kleinman. I can put up his info and making a note and um, become a grower for the network also and obtain some really cool seeds that you can have for your own use as well. Um, I currently, um, well, I want to also mention I've done work with um, Russell Crowe from a beancollectorswindow.org, 
And um, he's working with the Lobitz collection, which um, Robert Lobitz was a bean breeder out of Minnesota. He passed away and his, nobody really acknowledged the importance of the work he was doing. So when he died, they just cleaned out his whole um, cabin and his house, whatever, and um, tossed out his, um, all of his notes, which was quite a loss. And so Russell Crowe is trying to, um, you know, re, well, to identify and re um, unite the um, beans that they can find because he did share with local gardeners and his brother had some of the collection. And we've gotten over 116 of the named varieties back as well as some works in progress that were unnamed. And um, so I'm working, I've done work with the Lobitz collection as well. And Robert Lobitz was a great bean breeder. He bred for a lot of color and flash. Um, some of his beans are super colorful. My favorite was Purple Stardust, which was my friendship bean. That was like bean, my, like my bean ground zero, the one that made me fall in love with beans. Um, I, let's see, so the seed and food sovereignty relates to, so I've gotten rid of a good portion of my collection over the past two years. And I focused on working um, with Chris Hubbard, which the, the one slide is going to come up, but this is some of the examples. So Chris Hubbard is a Cherokee. I think it might be the next slide, Rebecca, if you want to go forward one um, or two, but yeah, here it is. Um, he's a part Cherokee um, down in Kentucky, and he has a tremendous, talk about one man seed bank. He has thousands and thousands of seeds in his collection. He's a third generation seed keeper. Um, so his grandfather was collecting seeds at the beginning of the you know, 1900s and they traveled the powwow um, circuits extensively and he works a lot with indigenous seeds so like the first nation seeds down here um, and I specifically am focused now on working with him and his collection he has is terminally ill and time is short so um yeah, we're a lot of the seeds are very old as well. We're having germination issues. So, but it's critical to find responsible, reliable helpers to grow out and have fresh seed. Um, so, if anybody's interested in working with indigenous seeds, um, yeah, that is experienced because some of these um, seeds he might literally have twelve seeds left. You know, of them, and um, so it's very stressful. And, um, you know, I've actually, you know, you lose a lot sometimes and you feel so bad, but um, you also have a lot of successes. So, you know, it's very challenging, very rewarding. And the whole point of Chris's work is to rematriate them to their people. You know, so, um, you yeah, know, we try and, you know, Chris and I've been trying to network and I know I just, I taught, saw Tiffany Traverse, hey, Tiffany, um, sent her some seeds. Um, but we're trying to reconnect them with their people. And, you know, so if anybody um, has any, you know, knows anybody from specific nations, I can go through what I have and see if anything is relative to your people and get them back to you. Um, it's a, you know, probably going to be a lifelong project for me, but we need people. Um, so, um, but it's very important and it's really neat. This one on the left, Sonuk family bean, the Osley birds. I love the name, get you buys. Super producing, really, really heavy producing full bean. So, um, and the deal is when you do grow outs for people like Chris, you grow out and you get to keep half and you send at least half back um, to the seed bank, which Chris maintains. Um, and myself, I keep a uh, samples off, you know, we try and not have all the samples at one site. So in case something happens like power outages and floods or whatever, fires, um, you don't want all the seeds in one place. And I should see somebody else grew up the same family bean. Um, let's see, and grow, you can forward the slide, Rebecca. I know I'm talking a lot and there's not a lot of time, but anyway, cultural preservation, um, is what my focus is now, you know, and the more I learn about these, you know, um, 
beans and other seeds that I grow out, you know, it connects me to the stories and I learn more about people and culture and their food ways. Um, you know, it's been a great learning experience. And I know somebody um, had asked about how do you grow out, you know, wanted to know, but here's a good picture of my pole beans. Um, so I'll put, you know, every, because I grow so many different varieties, the other thing I love about beans is that they don't cross pollinate easily. They do, you do get crosses, but overall it's like 85, 90%, um, you know, true to type because they self pollinate before the blossoms even open for the majority of them. Although I do have a few promiscuous examples, um, but the, a lot of crosses come with bumblebees, have strong jaws and chew through the sides of the blossoms before they even open. So I try and if I'm doing seeds for um, a girl, I'll do um, pole beans separately from the bush beans and, and separated by, you know, a couple hundred feet. Um, usually that's sufficient. And then I separate the pole beans, you know, I think they're four foot apart. Um, and I, I do a lot of varieties, so. Um, yeah, let's see. Okay, you can for, oh, the other thing I want to say about this picture was, I also am big on photographing, especially since some of these beans have not been grown out in many years. You know, we don't have information on blossom color, pod color, etc. cetera. Um, so I like to photograph them at all stages of the growth, um, you know, and keep, keep good records and label everything because as much as you think that you will. Um, somebody just mentioned Algonquin. I think the one on the right is an Algonquin bean. Um, pretty sure that was an Algonquin one. Um, anyway, okay, you can forward the slide, Rebecca. And here's some examples of Chris's beans. Really interesting, beautiful. Um, yeah, and highly endangered. So we can go forward. Just another viewpoint of the a lot of work putting up all the trellises. And I kind of already talked about the experimental farm network with the soccer blue. So I will go forward. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, working with seed companies. I just wanted this is CR Lawn, who's the founder of Fedco Seeds, which is one of my faves. Um, a lot of people don't realize, you know, that you can work with um, small scale companies like Fedco and you don't have to grow all that they will, um, you know, sell. So what I do, if I have a unique one, you know, first of all, that they will, um, they actually have been uh, a couple of years ago, I gave um, Hera and Breen's um, 10 different varieties of beans that were my favorites. So they're trialing them to see how they do and including soccer blue. And um, you, if you have, you, you develop a unique bean like soccer blue, then you will, can be paid number one to maintain foundation stock. So you don't have to have huge acreage of beans. You don't have to produce, you know, several hundred, you know, hundreds of pounds. You can produce, you know, 10 pounds or five pounds and maintain that foundation stock. And then when he, um, Heron passes it along to the larger growers to translate up the seed stock to larger quantities, you'll also be paid royalties based on that as well, if it's your unique bean. The other beans, um, you know, you get paid for what you produce. You know, the ones that are out there anyway. So um, there are opportunities working with small seed companies. They are interested. Um, this was a Canadian bean, that's why. I Put that slide in there. So, Deseronto, um, which is a sacred bean, it was used in the white dog ceremony. Um, you can forward one more bucket. And closing up is just about the friendships. I have made so many friends. Chris is standing right behind me, um, but the man in the red shirt in the center is Stephen McCumber, who is amazing, has been such an inspiration to me. But working, um, and he is an elder seed keeper of the Haudenosaunee 
Um, but working left to right, Joseph Lofthouse is super into land race breeding. Then Will Bonsell, a lot of people are familiar with him. He's up in Maine, incredible seed keeper. Mark Tejian, Stephen McCumber. Behind Stephen is Owen Taylor, who owns True Love Seeds. Give a huge shout out to him. His seed company is amazing with the um, work that they do. Um, super, yeah. Um, and Chris, and then um, Nate Kleiman, who owns the Experimental Farm Network project. Ken Etlinger, which is in the back. He's down Long Island doing work a lot with a lot of different seeds. And then Mamet Elliston, who owns Two Seeds in a Pod Heirloom Company. So, but, and then in front, those are all samples of my beans. And um, Bill Best and um, John Quick Quickendale. Um, to Southern people, I actually drove down to Kentucky and Tennessee each year to um, seed swaps. Um, Bill Best is uh, Appalachian um, uh, bean man. So he owns heirlooms.org, which if anyone is familiar with greasy beans, he knows more about greasy beans, which are a specific category of full beans. And um, yeah, so, and one last slide. I think there's actually two last slides, I think. Uh, Russ, there's Bevan Cohen on the left and Russ Crow is the one in the leather jacket. Um, he is um, the man doing the Lobitz bean collecting work and owns beancollectorswindow.org. And then the last man on the right is Jim White. He's a tomato guy. He's called Tomato Jim. And I'm staying next to Chris. Um, but just making wonderful connections around the world literally, and I love beans. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. What a wonderful presentation. Those slides were just beautiful and <laughs> lots of wonderful uh, conversations um, in the chat. I've been, I was distracted like reading the chats because there, there's a lot of chats. I'll, I'll so, try and get, I'll try to get to them. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks well, also, the, thanks for the interaction, guys. I really appreciate it. I know it's talking really fast, and especially if it was the translating was, you know, maybe hard to keep up with. But so. wonderful. It was. It was. It was great. Um, I'd love to now present it um, to pass the presenting over to Henry. Um, Henry, are you able to share your slides, or would you like me to? Uh, I can share. Perfect. Okay, can you see my slides now, my presentation? I can see it perfectly. Here, okay, perfect. So, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Henry. I'm a PhD student at McGill University. I work with uh, beans, uh, basically in beans genetics, trying to improve this uh, crop that we all are interested in. And as part of my research, I do a lot of process uh, between different kinds of beans. So uh, today I'm going to share you, with you a, a little bit about my experience, how to uh, make the crosses, and some tips and tricks about the, this hand pollination. So first of all, um, enter, and, okay. First of all, why do we uh, cross or hand pollinate beans? So we want to do that, that because as Lisa, as Lisa showed us, we have an incredible diversity of beans and we, uh, through hand pollination, we can play around with this uh, diversity we have. And we can also increase the diversity in the plant varieties we have. Uh, making crosses, we can combine, for example, different traits of interest, uh, such as uh, the color, the growth habit, how resistant they are to uh, pests or diseases. So this is a way that we can obtain new combinations and new uh, and interesting uh, results in, in our plants. And in a more technically uh, 
field, we can also find genes and improve this selection process. So, first of all, uh, we need to know the flower anatomy of beans. So in beans, we have mainly three uh, kind of petals. One big petal, which is the banner or the standard. Uh, we have two here, that is the wings. And we have two others that are the keels, but they are all rolled together and they form a tube. And within this tube, we have the female and the male organs. So we have here a better representation of the common uh, bean flower. And here this uh, roll is the, is the kills. And here we can see a little bit the stigma. Basically it comes out, uh, out when we move the flower or the wings. And if we cut the flower, we will see something like this. Uh, this is the kills. And here we have the female part, which is the stigma and the ovary. And we have the anthers, that is the male part with the pollen grain. And this is to show you that the flower of, uh, of beans is designed, uh, biologically designed to be self-pollinated. So that's something we want to break and avoid in order to make our process. So we need to be very careful to transfer the pollen from one flower to the stigma of another. So let's go through different steps for the, uh, for the pollination. The first step is to select the flower or the female flower that we will pollinate. Basically, we need to choose a flower buds that, are, that will open in one or two days. They should uh, look uh, pretty big because if they are uh, too small or immature, they won't be able to be uh, pollinated. So they need to be, they need to look fresh, uh, turgid and ready to be uh, opened. Once we select the female bud, we need to select the male flower. For the male flower, we need to choose a, a flower that is completely open, but a flower that just open in the morning or the, or the afternoon before uh, of the day we are uh, making the process because we want the pollen to be as fresh as possible to, uh, to guarantee that the pollen is viable. And when the flower is already opened, um, the, it's likely to be uh, self-pollinated because the anthers, the hist, and the, the pollen grain is uh, released and the stigma moves and collects the pollen. So at this point, the pollen will be in the stigma. So once we select the female and the male, we need to start the crossing process. So first we will open the female flower, which was closed as we can see here. We, will, we ideally need to use tweezers with a sharp tip. And we need to open a very carefully the standard and push back the edges to release the wings. So we can expose here the wings and we can identify them. Usually, uh, sometimes they are uh, all together, but they ideally they should be separated. And when we have the wings here, we need to activate the system of the flower to expose uh, the stigma. And basically we do that by pulling down the wings, like in this way, as we can see here in the picture. And when we do that, we will expose the stigma. The stigma will come out from the kills, the role I explained before. And this stigma should look healthy, um, also without pollen and completely white. That's a good sign that we have a good flower to be pollinated. Once we pull down the, the wings, the stigma will uh, uh, stay here out, but sometimes it could, it could go in uh, again. So we just basically need to pull down again the wings and it will come, up, come out again. It's like a, a 
Uh, now that we have our female flower opened and we have the stigma out, we will transfer the pollen. So for that, we have our uh, male flower, which is open, and we will do exactly the same. We will pull down the wings and the stigma we, uh, will come out again. But something uh, different in this stigma is that this stigma is kind of gray. We can see a gray powder in the stigma, and this is the pollen. So as the flower was already open, the pollination already occurred, and the stigma already collected the pollen that was released from the anthers. So the, all the pollen is, uh, the majority of the pollen is here on the stigma. So once we see this uh, pollen and in the stigma, we will collect the stigma. So gently, we will pick the, uh, the stigma, we will remove it from the flower very carefully because we don't want to drop the, the pollen in the way. And then we will transfer it to the female flower. In the female flower, remember, we had the stigma out, which was white and ready to be pollinated. So we will take the stigma with the pollen and we will brush it against one against, against the other. So in this way, we guarantee that the pollen is transferred from the stigma of the male flower to the stigma of the female flower. Remember, this uh, flower should be attached to the plant because sometimes when we start a uh, naked process, we, uh, we uh, can uh, remove the, the flower and that will be useful for practice, but not for the process. Uh, even if it is a little, uh, a very little break in the, in the part, in the, in the part that is attached to the plant from the flower, it's gonna be better to try a different flower. Once we brush the stigma, once it, uh, one against the other, we can leave the stigma or the donor stigma uh, hook in the in the female flower. So in this way, we guarantee that they are in touch and the pollen will be uh, will germinate and will pollinate the flower. Sometimes, depending on the conditions or uh, depending on the flower we chose, uh, we could find that the the flower the, fem the sorry the male flower doesn't have enough pollen or the pollen doesn't look very well, and we may we may have some doubts about the pollen and the cross. In that case, uh, we can just use another stigma from a flower from the same plant that we chose to be the, the parent, and we can leave two or three. It's, it's up to you, depending on how many you think it could be enough to, uh, to make sure that we will have a, a successful cross. So as we can see here in the picture, we can we can brush more than one a stigma and leave them there. Once we do that, uh, basically the cross will be uh, ready, and then we need to wait uh, to see if the cross is successful. However, something very important is to label our process because sometimes uh, we miss the labels or the tags, and we don't know what happened that. That's pretty common. That has happened to me sometimes, and it's uh, it's bad because sometimes you sometimes you you have a very good cross and you can't identify the parents. So usually you can use a very uh, small tax. You write down the name of the parent, of the male parent. So you will have the flower, which is the female, with the identification here. And uh, be careful because uh, in beans, we have uh, flowers that grow in groups. So make sure that you only grab the flower you pollinated. You don't, you don't grab other flower buds because at the end, you will, uh, you will have problems to identify what was the flower uh, you pollinated from the flower you didn't pollinate. So one, uh, after a week or a week and a half, you will start to see the, the pot growing. 
something like this. However, most of the crosses are aborted. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, the flower is designed to be self-pollinated. So the plant can sense when the, when the pollen isn't yours, it isn't from the plant. So the plant will abort the, the, the flower and you will lose the, the cross. But don't be disappointed because that happens a lot of time, uh, of times and the success rate is only 25% around 25%, it could be less or it could be a, a slightly higher. But that means that for, for one cross that you want, you need to make at least uh, 10 crosses or yeah, at least 10 crosses to have a good number. Out of 10 to 15, you will get two. So uh, in, if you get a, a higher success rate about 50 or 60% something is wrong because you will have a lot of uh, false positive uh, crosses. So sometimes you see that the cross you did is growing, but actually it isn't a, a cross, it is a self cross. So how to identify them? So we, uh, we know that we have a successful, a successful cross when we look at um, this kind of, of bots. For example, here we have a comparison between a successful, successful cross, which is this one, and this is a self-cross. We can see that usually the crosses we make, they are shorter, they don't look uh, perfect, they have a fewer number of seats, or they could have a different shape because we are trying to combine different plants that are not supposed to be combined. However, sometimes that it could happen that uh, we have both. Uh, crosses that look very healthy, like this one, or crosses that don't look very well, that's this one. So for that, we need to learn how to identify the self crosses. So for, for that, I also have some uh, tips Usually uh, a self cross, as I mentioned, look super healthy like this, uh, very long with uh, many seeds, depending on the variety you are working on uh, with a, a full number of seeds. In my case, I work with mainly with black beans. So they have between seven to eight uh, seeds per pot. So if I see that a cross has between seven or eight, even nine, I know it's a self cross. It's very, um, it's not uh, likely that this is a cross. As we can also see here, they look very good, very uh, long. And uh, as I mentioned here, we have this kind of, uh, of crosses. One, those uh, that look very uh, good and those that don't look very good. So I, something I do is try to choose those crosses that don't look very good. Uh, this is a tip. I, I select the crosses with the fewer number of seeds, so the chances that they are a true cross are higher. And we can start from there. Even if we only have a seed or a couple of seeds, it's better if we know that it is a, a successful cross rather than we are growing a self cross. In practice, this is, a, this is the best way to do it because we cannot, uh, we cannot know uh, for sure uh, in the farm. We can use some laboratory tests or once we have all the progeny uh, growing in the, in the field. But this is uh, something I do and has worked uh, so far very well for me, trying to choose those pots with that look odd. Um, just to finish, I wanted to talk to you uh, a little bit about the how I'm applying the crosses. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, make crosses could be a strategy to study uh, bean genetics. Um, most of the traits that we want or we desire in, in beans or in any plant, such as yield, uh, for example, the the pest resistance, the architecture, they are all complex traits, which means that they are controlled by multiple genes all together acting at the same time. Also because uh, they are controlled by the environmental conditions and the interaction between both the genes and the, 
envir in environmental conditions. So to study these uh, complex traits, mainly yield and how uh, things can be improved and building a mapping population. So for that, I started with eight different uh, black beans, uh, the, which are the parents or the founders. And I made 28 different uh, combinations to uh, produce two-way crosses. So uh, for that, I cross, for example, A with B, A with C, A with D. And in my case, I uh, consider A, B, or B, A as a reciprocal uh, cross. So I consider that they were the same. But sometimes some people can consider that A uh, times B is different from B times A. So it's up to you, but I, uh, I only did 28. And in this way, I, uh, I, may, I have made a lot of process. Then I had 70 different combinations because I also combined all of them. And then I am also combining uh, the, the, the different genomes in different plants, in single plants. So the idea with this pop population was starting from eight different plants. For example, if we have a different traits or different characteristics in, a, in each one of them, and then trying to combine them in, in single plants. Sometimes we can start within the same market class if we use, for example, only a black beans, but we could also try different kinds of beans, different market class, different beans with different shapes, different colors. Uh, this, the, that is gonna be a little bit more challenging because of the differences and the, in the genetics of the plants. For example, if we want to cross a navy with a black bean or a navy with a cranberry, it could be possible, but uh, our success rate uh, will be uh, lower. But this is a, an interesting approach to have a, more than one a trait of interest in single plants. So thank you so much. I'll be happy to take some questions if you have. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you so much. Henry, that was that was great. It's really nice to have some of that that technical detail that you you're able to share. Um, we have around 15, 20 minutes for some conversation. Uh, Hugo is creating uh, it so that you may see that the speakers are spotlighted. But I, I welcome you if you want to go to view and hit gallery view if you want to see everyone. And I just wanted to open it up to some, some questions from folks. Uh, there's been lots in the chat, but um, um, perhaps I'll start with some of the ones that came in through the Eventbrite. Maybe this is for you, Henry, but also maybe for Bob or Lisa. There was some questions around someone is growing beans and they're finding that over the years, the bean variety is becoming more vining. And they wanted to know if, if that, how do they prevent that vining from happening? And Another question that came up was, um, do you have any idea of what traits are dominant when you do a cross? I think those questions are related, so that's why I combined them. Okay, so from my experience, uh, the architecture is also a, a complex trait. Many uh, genes are working all together, so oh. the selection in progress will be slower. So if you are if you are working with the same variety, it is uh, probably that the con environmental conditions are affecting how your plant is growing. So try to look into the density of the plants, or if you are trying to select plants, be more strict in your stricter in your selections. So increase the selection intensity in that case, because it shouldn't happen. Um, sometimes you, we, you can have plants that are indeterminate, but it still are a uh, bushy in the time, in terms of how they grow. And you can also have determinate plants. Uh, ideally, you want indeterminate uh, plants that are keep growing, but uh, with a bushy architecture rather than defining. Thank you. 
because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the dominant traits, um, it depends. <laughs> depends on the trait you are working. Some sometimes you can find that uh, there are a uh, traits that are uh, that have alleles that are dominant. For example, in beans, we have a some genes that are major genes that control the color. Um, in beans, some some beans that are uh, red, they have a single uh, allele that that uh, determines that the beans are red, but the interaction between this single gene and many others is what uh, makes us to see the different patterns of colors. Some that are white, some that with spots, some that are uh, not like pink. So it depends on the of the trait of, on the traits of interest that you are working on usually. Oh, thank you, uh, Lisa. Yes. I'm just noticing you're muted, so unmute yourself and please answer. Okay. Um, if like, for instance, I grow black beans and, you know, if I'm going to save my own seed, there, there tends to be vininess um, in the, I have the black turtle beans. Um, if you're going to save seed from them, rogue out ahead of time whatever's vining before you go in and just save seed, like just rip the plants out. If anything's showing characteristics you don't want, um, you know, it's it's so easy to think, oh, I'll remember to not grab that one. But when the frost is coming or has come and you're just cold and whipping through the field, <laughs> you're just going to grab them. And, um, you yeah, know, it's just easier to be proactive ahead of time, remove, remove rogue what you don't want. Um, and that's what we do. So, yeah, a reminder to get out there before things are flowering. It's important. Yeah. Reminder to myself to label my dahlias before the freeze that's coming <laughs> because I always think, oh, I'll know which dahlia is which. And I never do after the freeze and they all look like blah. So, <laughs> I hear you there. <laughs> Another uh, question that's come through and maybe. Um, Bob, if you have anything to add to this as well, but I'll direct it to you, Lisa. Um, the question is, what are the needs of the bean growing community and what varieties are priorities? I feel like you and Bob both sort of touched on this, but I'm wondering if there, if you have anything additional to add. I mean, I would say for priorities, you know, it's what your passion is. What's the priority to you? What's the reason why you're saving seed? Um, you know, and one of the other, um, you know, there's different reasons, like the Lobitz collection, you know, definitely needs people growing them out and increasing, and they're super colorful, they're a lot of fun, and they're unique beans that, you know, were only recently developed in, you know, 70s, 80s, you know, um, and it's just like a fun, it's kind of like a treasure hunt, trying to, you know, find, oh, who he may have shared with and who has a jar in their freezer. So it's kind of fun. It's a treasure hunt. Um, whereas, you know, the cultural pressure of almost lost indigenous beings, like on the verge of extinction, um, you know, to me that, to me, that's very important is trying to um, save them before they're gone completely. So, you know, it depends what, what turns you on, what, what, what's your passion, you know, and try and follow that, um, you know, and I do want to say one thing that I struggled with, I used to talk more about the Indigenous collection and stuff, and um, I, I, I understand um, a lot of sensitivity to the issue of me not being Native and having some, some of these seeds that sometimes do have sacred connotations and are used ceremonially, um, you know, and I've come to the um, understanding, you know, I'm just kind of a temporary placeholder, you know, I don't, um, you know, until they get back to their people, you know, and I'm doing the best I can to help. And I feel like um, a lot of people were contacting me, so I don't talk about it anymore. Like a lot of people hold their hands out, gimme, 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 um, without understanding the full uh, cultural sensitivity to some of them. And so I tend to not talk about it anymore. And at first I was feeling kind of like the white guilt thing, you know, and then I decided I was asked by somebody to help him. I didn't insert myself in the project. 
I was invited. So I've come to terms with it, but I am quieter about it than I used to be. And I don't put them out on social media as much because it attracts a lot of the wrong energy. So, um, but I'm more than happy, you know, for dedicated people to contact me. I put up my email address um, and I'm also on social media. Feel free to contact me, you know, and yeah. So just want to make that point that I kind of had glossed over. So. That's a, a beautiful explanation. You, you may not have seen, but there were some hearts popping up from folks. Um, yeah, and, a couple so yes. people, Natasha, so Natasha and <laughs> Tiffany, <laughs> and friends with them anyway, so. Yeah. That's, that's and I good. thought Natasha might be the Deseranto I got from her. That's why I put that one up, <laughs> so. Wonderful. There's um, another question, perhaps connected to your Sacre Bleu, but Henry, you might also have some points after Lisa speaks, but how long does it take you to you know, make an observation uh, and find a new variety or perhaps do a hand pollination and then say that you you have a variety. How long is that process? It's um, some of them, you know, some beans, I think there's a lot of variation. Some beans kind of seem stable after a few generations and there's not a lot of shuffling, but then other beans I feel like are never going to stabilize. They're just always shuffling their genes, um, you know? So it's really, really hard. I think some of them are so like unsteady. I don't know, you know, so it, you know, I would say on average, you know, six, seven, eight years um, before you start seeing real steadiness consistently. Um, you know, it's a lengthy process. It's not, it's not quick. It's definitely not for the impatient people <laughs> um, breeding new varieties. Um, and Carol Depp has a good book, Breeding New Vegetable Varieties. That is um, a good resource on all, all kinds of things, but she explains a bit more about, you know, genetic shuffling and stuff. So yeah, Henry, did you have anything to add? No, your explanation was very clear about uh, seven to eight years. It's what it yeah. takes to fix the genome in a bean after self pollinated. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we all take such amazing journeys with, with seeds every year, even if you're just maintaining or stewarding a variety, but the, the creation of, of, a, of a new variety is, is also a beautifully long journey. Um, we have a, a question around um, sort of adapting. Uh, you had mentioned, Lisa, adapting long season beans from, from Central America, if I remember correctly, to our the, short season. Actually, I was wondering if you could talk about that. Actually, you have it exactly backwards. Oh, tell me more. <laughs> we're actually, the, I think you said it backwards. We're the, we're the long season. They're the short season. Maybe you said it right. Maybe I think I said I think I mixed it up. But um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, they're down south of course, from us. You know, of course they have the longer season. No, we have the long day season. So um, I've done a bunch of tried to do stuff with from South America um, and equatorial kind of region beans. And a lot of people think, oh, you need to increase their light and give them more day length. No, actually you need to build blackout cages and like decrease the length of light because up here, you know, in like the summer season when we're normally blossoming, you know, it's 14 hours of daylight or so. And, um, but if it's a South American bean it is, or Central American, um, they actually, the trigger to start blossoming is when days are shortening, which for us is after the fall equinox, you know, so September, you know, late September, third week of September. Um, so you want to fake them out, trigger that blossoming because they won't have a chance to mature before frost. So you need to trigger them to start blossoming before that. So you need to actually decrease their light. And it's a pain in the butt and I, might view it as a retirement project. <laughs> I don't have enough time being a market gardener. I, I, it was fun and a lot of them are super pretty and colorful, beautiful patterns, but um, you know, I just, yeah, don't have enough hours in the day as it is. So I don't know if Henry, uh, you know, have you done much work with doing them out of season? No, no, so far we are not uh, adapting 
genotypes yeah. from South America, but yeah, you are yeah. right about the daylight and the, the duration of the hours, day, uh, light hours. Yeah, the late hours. Because uh, a lot of people are also doing work with corn. Like when we try and grow a lot of the South American corns up here, they can get to be like literally 20 feet tall plus. And uh, they just get huge, but yeah, they don't start tasseling and producing until too late in the season in general. So. Yeah, there's a question yeah. here um, from Jennifer saying, I have a serious anthracnose in my garden and have been selecting breeding for resistance. Is there anyone else out there with this problem? Or perhaps I can add to that. Do you have any tips uh, for Jennifer in breeding for anthracnose, which is such an uh, important thing in our climate? I don't have any experience with that. Well, the, uh, I'm not an expert of anthracnose, but uh, my group uh, is working on anthracnose. Uh, ideally, we are, it depends also on the race of the anthracnose. Sometimes you can breed the, your plant for a race of anthracnose or, or the fungi that cause anthracnose, which is a coletotrichum. So, and once you, you come out with a variety or a plant that is resistant to one race, you could have another race present in your, uh, in your garden or in your field. So the best way is to try to combine the resistant to different uh, races. Uh, actually, that's something we are trying to identify now, what kind of races we have here, because as we see previously, we have different varieties every year. So we are constantly changing, trying to grow different plants. So it's not an easy way. Try to uh, give the conditions. Anthracnose needs, as a fungi needs uh, moisture. And yeah, sometimes you can just be selecting for one race. It could be a reason, but a deeper study could be useful in that case. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. There's a question here from Craig. Um, they say, I have a genetics question regarding seed color. I'm working on a diverse population that arose from a single plant, and I'm trying to eliminate totally white seeds from an otherwise very colorful mix. However, simple selecting, simply selecting them out doesn't work. In the following generation, they come back in a similar distribution. It's like an infinite segregation or something. Can, any suggestions on how to approach this? Well, uh, as I mentioned, the color is a pretty interesting uh, trait in beans, as it gives us this amazing diversity. There are many genes involved. Uh, I would say that uh, from what you say, it's maybe the your population size is, is small. I'm not sure how many individuals you have. Uh, try to increase the, the number of plants. It's on a, uh, and you could be lucky that you get one plant that is segregating the alleles, or in this case, the, the traits that you want. In, uh, plants that only have uh, uh, seeds with color, and you take uh, you can remove or eliminate the white seeds. Usually, it's uh, it's due to that the the population size, which I know increase the population size is usually expensive and feel and uh, resource consuming. So. But that you that is usually the way to do it. Hopefully that would, that that will help you, Craig. Yeah, I would Thank agree also. Okay. Just keep at it. <laughs> Grow more and more. Some some comment in there was after this presentation, I want to grow all the beans. And that is also how I feel. Um, there's just, as Hugo has said, there's so many questions and so little time, um, but I feel like to honor everyone's time, perhaps I will close up our discussion here. Um, I have a few little closing slides and it's, um, you know, I feel like we're going to continue these conversations offline 
Uh, thank you, Lisa, for adding your contact information. And Henry, if you feel comfortable, you can maybe drop into the chat your uh, information as well. Yes, for sure. I will leave my email so you can contact me if you want. We had, you know, we've had so many resources shared in the chat. Uh, we'll save save the chat and try and email some of those resources out to registrants. We'll also be sending out some of these other resources, like I mentioned. Um, there's the, the beginner seed saving uh, presentation that was done, and there's these other really great um, guides that we've gotten from folks um, over the years that have just really help uh, us in, in, in our work that we do. Um, and yes, first of all, I just really like to say a big thank you to Bob and Lisa and Henry. Thank you for sharing your insights and experiences. There's just so much information. And thank you to everyone who participated and asked questions and filled the chat with hearts. I also additionally want to thank uh, Hugo for keeping things seamless behind the scenes and to Peter and Adrian for translating for us, um, including all of these you know, technical and agricultural words. Um, please know that um, we value your insight. And so Hugo's just thrown up there a little uh, poll just to get some information from you. It's, we'll, we'll keep your feedback here um, just for our staff team. But we're also hoping that you might throw into the chat some ideas for virtual events, maybe speakers or topics that you want to hear from. You know, I feel like we could hear from so many wonderful people and sometimes I can't think of them all. So we uh, value your input. Um, Hugo will also throw into the chat uh, a link to a survey from the About It initiative where we're collecting the Canadian vegetable seed production training needs. And that's another place you, you can give us feedback on how we can support you in, in doing the seed saving and seed keeping work that you're all working on. And you know, don't hesitate uh, to send additional comments to me. My email is super easy. It's just Rebecca at efao.ca. Um, oh yes. Also, Hugo wanted me to mention that there's this pretty fun Facebook group where there's you know almost a thousand members here. Uh, beans of the world. There's lots of conversations about sharing beans. You know, Lisa talked about beans going from, if I remember correctly, Germany to Italy to the US to her fields. So there's lots of wonderful sharing that, that happens there. And that was also pretty much, uh, you know, made possible through Facebook as well. And there's also another group that I help admin and that's called Heirloom Bean Addicts Anonymous. Forgot to mention that one. Perfect. Oh, and there's even a great one, um, Bonin Atlas, B-O-H-N-E-N -E uh, hyphen Atlas. And that's actually based out of Germany. Corey Met is like the, she runs a treasure chest of beans and she shares around the world and they have a phenomenal collection, thousands. Wow. And you can okay. request samples. I should type that one in, I'll type that one in. Wonderful, chat. thank you, Lisa. <laughs> So many ways to stay connected. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have want some information, you can find us um, at the websites here. You can connect if you're in Canada with the regional coordinators of the Bauda Initiative. And if you had fun talking about beans and also want to talk about uh, very cool biennial roots rutabagas in this case. We have a rutabaga webinar coming up on October 25th. Um, we have some um, exciting presentations from a seed saver in northern Alberta and someone in Minnesota working with the experimental um, farm network that Lisa mentioned who's working on a rutabaga grex, a amazing 
big mix of, of rutabaga varieties. And perhaps you'll also see a carving of the rutabaga. I did last Halloween. What I'm saying is it is gonna be great. Um, <laughs> and don't worry, um, we'll be adding this bean webinar to our YouTube channel soon. And we'll send a link to all the registrants when, when it's ready. So thank you all. Thanks again. It's been thank you. simply wonderful having you all here.